So Aaron Hay, uh, you're the production designer on Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, which is uh, a big epic retelling about the life of Freddie Mercury, the uh, front man of Queen. Uh, just tell us a little bit about what initially drew you to this project. Uh, well, it was uh, the circumstance, really. I mean, it was the fact that I had worked with um, with Brian Singer uh, previously um, for a, a television show as well as a, um, a feature that he had been developing. Uh, spent about a year and a half doing a couple of projects with him prior to this one. Um, we were developing 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and uh, and that went uh, that went down when he decided to do um, Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, you've been an art director for a long time. This is uh, the first thing uh, that you've, this is the first credited feature film that you've had as a production designer. So mm. this is quite a, you know, a big, you know, one to start with um, and to put your name out there for the first time. So did you feel any kind of, um, I don't know, uh, anxiety or, you know, a bit more of a sort of a, you know, a need to prove yourself? Uh, I mean, that's a definitely a good question, but, um, uh, I felt really comfortable with uh, with the material and um, with the team that we put together, um, which made it feel really comfortable. And um, uh, I tend to like to um, just absorb all the research I can possibly get my hands on. And uh, and just dive. Um, pretty much my entire adult life, so I've I've been around a, a film set or two, so it felt it felt very natural. Uh, you mentioned the research, and obviously Freddie Mercury is somebody who uh, there's a lot of footage of him out there. Um, a lot of people <laughs> um, uh, think they you know know a lot about him. So I, how did you start with the research? Well, uh, I mean, obviously there's a tremendous amount available online and in print, and so just absolutely dug into all of that we could find. And just filled an office with um, with basically images. I, I sort of knowing that um, that we that the primary part of our, our film was going to take place between 1970 and 1985, roughly. We just sort of developed um, a long timeline and then filled the uh, filled boards with um, images of uh, his childhood, his adulthood, um, as well as of course uh, the band and the timeline of the band as well. And then we were fortunate enough um, that Brian May and Roger Taylor were uh, involved and in producing the film. So they came in um, to the office regularly. And um, in the beginning, um, after their first visit, um, Brian invited us to his house where he has an incredible archive of everything Queen related. You could imagine it was um, pretty remarkable to have access to that um, to that resource. Uh, so we saw every ticket stub and every um, uh, every instrument and every everything that we could look for. Every um, uh, recording that they ever made was in a vault, and they have a wonderful archivist who is kind enough to uh, to walk us through that space and show us wardrobe and print material and all sorts of things. So we had a lot of really wonderful reference there as well. And then additionally, we had um, uh, Peter Freestone, who was um, Freddie Mercury's, uh, you know, a good friend of his, and as well as a, a personal assistant for the last sort of ten years of his life or more. And um, he had been around for years and had a wealth of knowledge, um, as well as uh, photographs, his own personal collection. He was he was able to to show us some photographs that we'd never seen before for details with sort of things like the um, the Garden Lodge, Freddie's house in London, and, uh, and things like that. I was able to get some really wonderful reference for that. Well, this is your classic rags to riches story. Um, Pretty much. Obviously, there is a big transition that happens over the course of the movie. Can you just talk a bit about, I guess, showing the difference between, you know, Freddie Mercury before he joins Queen and then throughout and he, as he becomes more and more of an icon? Yeah. Um, well, really, uh, the, the movie initially, uh, there was we filmed quite a bit that would have taken us further back. We went as far back as 1955, actually, and shot um, uh, Freddie's childhood in Zanzibar and uh, a little bit in India. Um, and that stuff ultimately was cut from the film, I think, just for running length more than anything. Um, but um, uh, so 
and this was Farouk Bolsara. This was a, a, a boy who was born uh, in an island in Africa to a, an Indian Parsi family and somehow managed through circumstance to, uh, you know, go to school, grow up in Africa, go to school in India, then move to uh, England in his teens and become, you know, a rock idol uh, a short time later. And it's, it's a pretty remarkable journey and something he didn't really uh, dwell on and talk about and, and um, uh, part of his story that I think is, is pretty remarkable. Right. Um, in terms of color and things like that, mm. what were your ideas? Because I mean, you know, Freddie Mercury is known of, of nothing else as being stylish. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, that was hugely important, and from the beginning. So that was that was uh, as I mentioned, this sort of the idea of a timeline and and uh, a palette. And so uh, the first thing I did was was to create a um, uh, with our research, basically take images that really felt of the period for every year and pull a palette out of each of those. So starting in 1970 and going to 1985, we had a basically a palette for every year or every other year. And that became sort of the, the start of the conversation and obviously it evolved from there, but there were such distinct looks between the sort of warm uh, avocados and, and, uh, and browns and bricky reds of the early seventies. And then you get into these sort of bright disco colors and into the, um, primaries of the 80s and this pastel as you get further in and it was it's just such a fantastic um, time period to work with and palette to play with and um, so between um, our, our department and of course Tom Siegel uh, the, the DOP we discussed all of that and when Julian Day um, uh, came in he he really tried to um, uh, come up with a holistic idea we really wanted to each of these time periods and each of these scenes to to convey the feeling of the time as well as um uh, of course the characters that were in them and i mean that was really part of the the narrative was was um the color and tone um i hope and um the most amazing thing i will say about that um which i think uh is hard to describe the feeling when you know sort of julian and i uh, had a conversation early on about what colors we were feeling when in the script, but didn't. I didn't see his costumes, and he didn't see my sets being built until the moment that walked on set, and the other guys walked on. And there were a uh, costumes would walk into a set. Um, that we just finished painting and wallpapering and lighting and creating and then all of a sudden you get these characters in and there there was like the best way I think I can describe it is like a, um, uh, a you know like a jam session like a like a, a chord of color so three different things the design and the lighting and the costumes coming together and playing a, a visual chord and that that was um, there were a couple moments once in the garden lodge and once specifically I remember in in uh, in Munich recording studio when when Freddie's sitting down and his color and the it just it gave it gave me such a, a chill it was so wonderful to see that collaboration come together right um, I wanted to talk about the concert scenes um, mm. because they're, they're such a huge part of the movie and um, obviously I mean the the live aid concert ends it um, and that's a, a huge climax but there's also all these other big musical moments throughout. So can you just talk a bit about uh, designing those sets? Yeah, absolutely. We, we had um, um, a number, obviously, of, of uh, concerts to deal with, starting with um, with the band that was Queen before they were Queen, the band Smile. And um, so that was, at that time, they were playing in bars and college uh, uh, auditoriums and that sort of thing. So we, we decided to start with a small concert and, um, and go from there, and we found some really wonderful, wonderful location in um, uh, in London for that particular show. And actually, found we almost shot in just right next door to there uh, an actual sort of town hall where where Queen played a gig in 1971 or something like that. And uh, so, pretty remarkable to get to to get to be in these spaces that that were historically um, accurate. And then for the um, the big concerts as they started to grow and we we were all over the the globe really we had um we were in japan and the us and brazil and uh, obviously the uk um 
and uh, trying to create these big environments, we came up with a with a plan um, that basically had uh, had us uh, create a stage on a, a, a large um, performance space in uh, in London um, called LH Two, where we um, where we created a generic stage and then had um, had uh, lighting and uh, stage design and and sort of. Uh, instrument cues that we could change around overnight um, and change from say Brazil to to Japan um, which uh, initially we were meant to have like a week between each of those setups and in the end it turned out we were sort of doing uh, four different shows back to back uh, overnight more or less um, so it was uh, it was important that we came up with a, um, a strategy where we could uh, we could evolve their their uh, their stagecraft as well as their lighting, which was huge um, with uh, for Tom Siegel to uh, create uh, a replica of what uh, Queen had as a lighting design in those early 70s and late 70s shows, which eventually became sort of the the climax of that time for me was the um, the Madison Square Garden show, which which was um, uh, massive lighting elements and and really um, a fun, amazing show to do. Um, so. Um, so yeah, it was a matter of, of really sort of coming up with a strategy for that. And of course, Live Aid was an entirely different process because it was just a uh, massive undertaking. It was a, um, um, from the beginning um, on that concert, we really wanted to be able to um, experience backstage life. And um, there was a dressing room and feel the Wembley Stadium and, and everything like that, and then be able to come through that and in one shot walk out onto stage uh, in front of uh, eighty thousand people. And so we we built a massive uh, a massive set for that um, out in a field north of London, which was an amazing experience. Well, it's such a huge set piece. I mean, it's about what twenty minutes of the movie, and uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it was it was it was week one as well. So it was oh, wow. one of those things where not only for for um, the cast uh, and the the band members themselves um, uh, to uh, to be at a hundred percent on day one was a remarkable feat, and then for us to to build um, what eventually was um, a seventy thousand square foot platform with with a a stage interior and exterior as well as the um, concourse of Wembley Stadium and uh, the backstage elements um, for day one was well, a challenge. Um, but um, we knew uh, the moment that the that our band Queen got on stage, not even in Brazilian clothes and. Um, the Brian May and Roger Taylor were there to actually experience that first time that they rehearsed on stage, and it was spine tingling. Everyone just was just blown away by their performances, and we suddenly knew that um, it was going to work. So, yeah. I mean, I guess once you've gotten that out of the way, everything else is <laughs> well. Yeah, I mean, that that's uh, there's a bit of that that's true. It was sort of um, okay, we got this. Now we just yeah. have to uh, maintain this pace for the next uh, few months, and we'll get through it. You know, right. Um, one thing that I found interesting in your filmography, uh, you have a background in visual effects. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder, like, how did one lead to the other, and, and what did you learn during your time uh, doing that field that helped you today? I mean, in your in your job as a production designer. Well, some of that that question broke up, I'm afraid, but I, I think oh. I got the gist of it, um, which was basically, um, uh, yeah, so I started in visual effects at Industrial Light and Magic um, and spent years uh, there, um, which I considered like the most amazing, um, for me anyway, the best graduate school experience I could possibly have um, for, for about eight or 10 years I was there and, and um, um, was there at a time, I was in practical effects doing miniatures and so I got a chance to, to work um, in, uh, in the design phase of things, painting, building models, working in the wood shop, metal shop, so I got a chance to, to um, and then to train in CG and, and um, uh, really had a chance to explore all of these different sides of, of the industry as well as being on set and um, having people that were incredible mentors and um, really um, uh, I feel like I was there at a, at, a, at a kind of a golden age and a lot of uh, really wonderful talented people were there um, and 
I sort of came into the art department side of things more or less through a funny back door where I, I wanted to, um, as I was building um, in visual effects, I wanted to be able to actually um, use a laser cutter, which was, I, th I thought, the coolest tool, tool. You know, these I could actually build things if I drew them on the computer. So I learned how to use a computer to design. And then um, my first experience actually uh, drafting for a film was on the Matrix uh, sequels in their visual effects department. and. It was an amazing experience, and then um, uh, the production designer um, and art director that I worked with on that um, invited me to come down uh, and work in an art department in LA doing a, um, a Superman, Superman film that was never made back in 2002 or 2003, and so that was my transition into, uh, into art department, and I basically, um, I was so enamored of this idea of designing things in 3D. Um, that um, I never looked back. I sort of felt like um, there was a, a new world waiting out there in terms of um, really um, finding, uh, using this new tool to um, to uh, create worlds, really. And um, uh, so I was fortunate enough to sort of land into that and, and find my way through. Well, this movie's a massive hit, so I know I'm not the only person who's seen your work and been impressed by it. Uh, Aaron Hay, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. It's uh, absolutely been a pleasure. You're welcome. Have a good one. All right. Take care.